Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume ranked edition and we're all the way to the year 1994, which means there's going to be some fresher, some aquatic fragrances. We're really getting into the heart of the aquatic wave that starts to wash away everything uh, is the way that I describe it. Everything changes once we get to 1995, 1996, uh, but we're right starting to get into the heart of the aquatic age. But there's actually... Uh, even with, you know, this time in fragrance history where many fragrance connoisseurs like myself, it's not their favorite time. Usually they think a couple years ago is sort of when the golden years of perfume died, 1991, 1992, 1993, depending on who you ask. Um, and that's usually the end of an era. And I agree, I think it is the end of an era. However, I have 13 full bottles from the year 1994. And some of these are absolutely fantastic. Some of my all-time favorites. Um, you might be shocked at how many amazing fragrances are mixed in with some of these fresher releases that came out. So uh, it's a balancing act. So the first thing I have to say, a little bit of housekeeping before we go forward. These are just my opinions, okay? So keep that in mind. I'm not dissing your fra fragrance if I have it at number 14, number 13, number 12, number 11. I'm not saying number one is objectively better than... Uh, number 14 or anything like that. These are just my personal opinion, my rankings of how I would rank them right now today, July 31st of 2023. And remember, tastes change as time goes on. Um, the other thing is I have a little bit of a cold, so I can't really smell that well. Um, so that's why we're doing sort of a list video today, taking a break from our normal uh, review schedule. Um, but uh, my nose is a little clogged, so if I sound uh, a little congested, it's because I am. It's one of these... Uh, I mowed the grass yesterday and I have this terrible grass allergy and every time I mow the grass it's just like I get a couple days of this uh, and then it ends up going away. Um, it's funny because I went to an allergist when I was in college and they said uh, back, you know, they test you to see, they, they poke you with all these different things, see what you're allergic to and then they build like a little shot that's supposed to solve you of your allergies. And um, apparently it did not solve me for the rest of my life, like they claim, because they are back in, in full swing. So uh, bear with me. Sorry for the uh, little bit of congestion. I'll try not to um, clear my nose in your ear. So uh, let's get started. Before we get started on the 14 fragrances from my collection, though, that came out in the year 1994, um, we are going to do Scent of the Day. And we are going to talk about some famous things that happened in the year 1994, just to set the mood. Some fa some famous uh, news stories, if you if you will. So there's a handful that uh, really would jump out to you if you go all the way back in time to 1994. So Michael Jackson marries Lisa Marie Presley. That was 1994. Um, also, there was a major earthquake in. Um, uh, the San Fer Fernando Valley in California. That was a big news story. But to me, there's really two news stories that when I think back, it just encapsulates the year 1994. One, Nancy Kerrigan gets attacked. Could you imagine if we had the internet back then? I mean, I know we had the internet, but um, we didn't really have the internet like we did today. Could you imagine if we had the internet like we did today with this Nancy Kerrigan attack? Um, you know, it, it was... Uh, Tanya Harding was uh, wins the National Figure Skating Championship title, but is stripped of her title following an attack on her rival, Nancy Kerrigan. Not funny. Uh, it's not a funny story, but I know a lot of people made fun of it then. But um, I feel like the internet just takes it to another level. And um, I could just imagine if that news story came out today. Also, here's something interesting. Netscape Navigator was released and quickly became the leading market the market leader for browsing the web, and, and look how quickly their lead uh, evaporated. Microsoft stepped in and just um, ended up taking it over with Internet Explorer, but Netscape had the lead for a little bit. That's an interesting case study. Um, Nelson Mandela became the um, first, become uh, became the president of South, of South Africa, and uh, the other big news story for me, uh, from 1994, of course, is O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson in his white Bronco. How could you ever forget that scene? I remember exactly where I was when I was watching that. I was actually at a neighbor's house, um, probably playing... What, what, what were kids playing in 1994? Super Nintendo? That had to be a thing, right? Probably playing Super Nintendo uh, or, or Doom on the computer or something. And um, so, yes, the uh, O.J. 
Simpson fleeing police in the white bron bron bronco. That was 1994. Okay, so there were obviously other stories. Um, you know, Brazil wins the World Cup. Um, stuff like that. Civil War in in uh, Rwanda. But for me, the the two big ones, O.J. Simpson and uh, Nancy Kerrigan, just really stand out as sort of setting the mood for 1994. So that's the backdrop. Okay. So let's do scent of the day. And today is a very special scent of the day, I'll tell you that. It is uh, the first time I've worn this as my scent of the day, but I had a chance to try it thanks to uh, generosity of the person who actually ended up selling me the bottle, Eddie. And so Eddie um, sent me a beautiful sample of this and I had a chance to test it and I absolutely loved it. I adored it. I said at the time, if you go watch my DS and Durga live stream, uh, you'll see this was the one that just instantly jumped out to me. I think it's one of the best uh, boozy scents in my collection. Top five for sure. And it is Spirit of the Glen by D.S. and Durga. Now this came out a decade ago. And unfortunately, it is discontinued. And so th these are really hard to find. Um, Eddie gave me a very fair price on this. It's sort of a woody, spicy um boozy scent but the notes in it are are unique and interesting so it opens up like so and it sits in here and there's a little book that comes with it although i'll spare you the details um but in a nutshell it says that ds and durga actually went and worked with um uh glenn levitt so they actually worked with glenn levitt hence the name spirit of the glen and uh, it, it shows the quality of this is out of this world. In fact, I, um, me and my wife, uh, we took a trip to New Orleans two or three months ago. I forget exactly when, but uh, we took a trip to New Orleans and she had a friend who um, actually makes spirits in the back of the restaurant that she runs. She's like a manager at this place. And uh, one of the things that they had there were these um, old... Uh, Jack Daniel oak barrels that she was distilling, I think whiskey, she said in there. I can't remember uh, if they were using it for something else. Uh, she might have been distilling something else in the in the oak barrels other than whiskey. I can't exactly remember, but I definitely remember the smell of the of the oak barrel itself. And this has this brilliant sort of cask, oak cask barrel. There's like a sherry cask note. There's a bourbon whiskey barrel note. Um, there's some barley malt in the base, and of course, um, it's beautifully uh, smooth. That's the thing about this fragrance that really sets it apart for me, is the smoothness. The way that the woods, there's a pineapple weed note with scotch whiskey. So Glenn Levitt, obviously known for their scotch. Um, so there's a scotch whiskey note in the top with pear and this pineapple weed note and limousine oak. And it is just so smooth. It's like drinking the smoothest scotch you could imagine. Just woody, um, malty, and all of these different elements, you know. And actually, one of the things that she did is uh, whenever we went to, to the back of where they were doing the distillation, she took like, um, like she scraped the barrel where some of it was, uh, some of the resin was building up around the outside because they'd open it up and close it. Um, and around, I guess, the opening, there was this resin that was beginning to form, and she sort of took it and put it on a, um, almost like a postcard that they had that showed their restaurant and stuff like that, and man, I could smell it on that thing for weeks. It was so realistic, and that's exactly what this reminds me of. It's so unbelievably good. Slightly, um, there's like this hay-like undertone, but it's, uh, there's a, there's a slight bit of sweetness in here, but there's no vanilla. Uh, and, and I think it comes from the, you know, oak barrel feel itself. Sometimes oak can, can have a slight vanillic twist to it. And it's just a brilliant um, uh, spirits fragrance, you know, a fragrance that uh, really highlights this scotch whiskey note to perfection. One of the best. I wish, I wish more bottles were available so more people could experience how good this is, but... If you ever see it and you're a lover of boozy fragrances, put this on the list. Spirit of the Glen by D.S. and Durga. The best D.S. and Durga that I've smelled so far. So, that was my scent of the day. Um, so, let's let's do this top 14. So, uh, number 14 is 
probably the only fragrance from this list that I would say smells cheap. Okay, this is the cheapy of the list. To be fair, it's discontinued. It's not fetching discontinued outrageous prices because no one really cares about this fragrance. I bought it because it was so cheap on fragrancebuy.ca. I think I, I paid like 10 bucks for this or something. No one wants it. It's a 100 ml bottle um, of Wings for Men for those heavy days. Wings for Men by Giorgio Beverly Hills. And if you look at the color of this bottle, what does this remind you of? What does this color remind you of? For me, it's Nautica for Men. The OG Nautica for Men, which I think came out very similar time frame to this. Um, but Nautica for Men to me, it actually smells similar too. Uh, but Nautica for Men has a higher class feel, which is crazy to say that Nautica for Men has a higher class feel than this, but it absolutely does. Um, this feels very synthetic. It's sort of this, um, fresh take on like, a um, it's a very synthetic smelling fragrance, but there's some lavender in the top. There's a little bit of neroli, which here smells the very cheap kind. We'll talk about some more expensive neroli fragrances as we go along. Neroli is a note that was very popular in 1994, obviously. Uh, but it just has this uh, very synthetic quality to it. That's just the way it smells. It smells um, extremely synthetic, and there's a little bit of lavender, um, but it has this very fresh laundered, it's like a, imagine throwing a fresh laundered sheet into the ocean, you know, this sort of weird blend of fresh and aquatic, and um, there's clary sage and geranium and coriander and tonka bean and cedar and oak moss and amber and musk and all those notes you you would think one or two of them would come across smelling natural. They don't. Everything in this smells synthetic and cheap. And uh, But you know what? I bet you at the time, um, this sort of weird flowery aquatic thing, um, I bet you it, it, it was pretty popular. And I'm going to review this one of these days. Well, my hope is to review all my fragrances. And, um, you know, at some point, it's just a matter of we'll see how many of these bottles I get to keep. But um, yes, this is Wings for Men by Giorgio Beverly Hills. Okay, so that's number 14. Number 13, next on the list, is going to be a fragrance that was very kindly gifted to me by... Um, oh gosh, who was it? Um, Justin. Uh, Justin gifted this to me, and, and he said it's one of his favorite fresh scents, and this is definitely a step up. If I feel like it doesn't deserve to be number 13, but I have to put it here just because of where the rest of the board sort of fell. Um, this is Fashionable, Fashionable from 1994 for men. This is the original uh, packaging, and actually this is an old tester that he very kindly sent to me. And um, you can see on the back it says peppermint and rosemary in the top. And I like that rosemary bit. So the peppermint, um, it definitely adds this bit of freshness. And there's a you're going to notice a similar fresh theme throughout many of the fragrances on the back end of my list here. So um, the, the, the thing that puts this above Wings for Men by a pretty substantial margin, actually, and um, this is actually still being produced. This is uh, still available. It's just in a different looking bottle now. They've changed the packaging. I don't know what the new one's like, but I can tell you that this has this brilliant, fresh, sort of uh, lavender, sort of like a musky lavender um, with spices and just the way that that rosemary adds a little bit of old school masculinity to a very modern scent at the time. Actually, I still think this smells very modern, even though this came out in 1994. Um, this, this still smells very modern to me and I'll, I'll review this. It's sort of like a fresh floral lavender, um, spicy scent with some woods underneath. So there's a little bit of cedar and sandalwood and oak, old school oak moss. But, uh, the focus is all on sort of that modern floral freshness for men. The lavender and the rosemary keeps it slightly on the masculine side, but honestly, there's nothing that would stop a woman from wearing something like this, um, they would, they would smell fresh and clean. And, and, um, some, some people that wear perfume, that's the goal of it, just to smell fresh and clean. They don't really care about anything else, but I like the little packaging. I like the fact that the cap has the almost, uh, soap on a rope look. Um, good stuff. Fashionable for men from 94. Okay. Next on the list is going to be 
maybe a surprise for some people that it's this low, that it's actually number 12 on the list. But uh, again, just the way that the board fell. And also, I think part of it is my bottle because I got this bottle off of eBay and the person that sold it to me really didn't tell me that the top notes had turned a little bit. The whole fragrance hasn't turned, but you've got to sort of sit through 10 to 15 minutes of eh, questionable, let's say, um, notes. But this is Millicene Imperial, and this is in the old packaging from the early 2000s. This is what the original uh, Millicene bottle looked like, and now they went back to the gold. But you'll notice now that they went back to the gold packaging, uh, it is not in the 75 mil. It's in the 50 or 100 mil. So this is one way you can tell um, if it is one of the older packaging. But um, the the uh, the scent itself is one of Pierre Bourdon's. You know, this was really sort of his because um, he had a Rolfa before this, obviously, and um, it's funny, Parfumo still doesn't give him credit for this. Uh, I think it's pretty common knowledge now that this is Pierre Bourdon's creation. Uh, it's black currant and violet leaf in the top, and um, these mar this marine-like notes in the mid with iris, and so that's the thing about this fragrance that I think it's so alluring. It's so It's got this musky, marine sort of woodiness that, you know, Pierre Bourdon does fresh scents like like nobody. He he really perfected both sides of the genre. He perfected Koros, so he did dirty scents like no one else, and then he ended up doing these fresh scents, which are just unbelievable. And this has a lot of clones. Um, I don't know what the new... Actually, I, I have a sample of a newer um, decant or, or, you know, like official Creed sample of Millicene Imperial. So maybe I will review it just off of, because I know that sample is fresh. This bottle I wouldn't review off of just because um, I'm not really 100% sure uh, how well it's held up. I know it hasn't held up too well because the top notes have turned a little bit. But if you like sort of these fresh, you know, this this was one of the fragrances that really put Creed on the map in the luxury space because um, Puff Daddy or Sean Combs or P. Diddy or Puff or whatever you want to call them, um, he um, he was very vocal about saying this is my signature scent, and uh, of course he was very popular in in the in the nineties as well, um, and so that really pushed some sales of Millicene Imperial. But if you have never smelled this, I would urge you to to give it a sniff. It is um, nineteen ninety four Millicene Imperial by Creed at number twelve. Number 11 is another Creed, and I went back and forth which one to put, you know, number 11, number number 12. Easily, they could have been swapped, but I ended up putting this at number uh, 11 just because uh, I remember how much I really enjoyed this scent whenever I, and I, and I ran through the entire bottle. Uh, this is a four ounce, uh, it's a 120 mil bottle of uh, Creed's Neroli Sauvage. And again, remember, Neroli is sort of a popular note in, the, in 1994. And this is probably one of the better Neroli fragrances that I've smelled as of late. Um, but whenever I wore this, I didn't realize that Creed took this scent DNA from a much cheaper fragrance for men. And it's called Eau de Rochas Pour Homme. This came out one year before this. And um, I think this is an absolute masterpiece. One of my favorite sort of uh, floral, citrusy, fresh fragrances to wear in the heat. And this was one such fragrance as well. And they did a very similar thing that Creed always does. They put some expensive ambergris or, or you know, if, if you want to call it salty ambroxin, whatever their, you know, base note is, that uh, salty ambergris base that Creed loves to use with a very high class neroli in the top with vervain and beautiful citruses. So bergamot, grapefruit, lemon, bitter orange, and then orange blossom. So you have neroli and you have orange blossom, and it's just brilliant in the heat, and you could just spray away with this. I mean, you could just flat out spray away. You can never overspray this. It's brilliant for the heat, uh, but honestly, these two, it just sort of depends on the day. I think if this bottle was in better condition, maybe this would be um, above Neroli Sauvage, but I don't have any more juice of this, so, um, but for our ranking today, Neroli Sauvage is going to be at number 11. Number 10. Uh, number 10 is a creation by the great Harry Fremont. Harry Fremont does not get very much love, 
But um, I'm a big fan of his creations. Um, he did the original Michael. He did uh, Polo's Purple Label, which I will review one of these days. I have a decant thanks to uh, the great Anuj. And he did this. This is Polo Sport. One of the scents of basically high school for me. This is high school. This is... Um, this is what all the boys in the locker room wore. You know, this is what a high school locker room when I went to school smelled like. And um, this is a very, actually, for for the way that it smells, some people smell this and they think it's a simple creation. It's not. It's actually a very complex creation. Listen to this note listing. Aldehydes, mandarin orange, lavender, mint, tarragon, neroli, bergamot, lemon. Remember, neroli. Seagrass, cyclamen, geranium, jasmine, rose, rosewood, and ginger with a base of amber, guyac wood, sandalwood, cedar, and musk. That's a hell of a note listing for a fragrance that many people just write off as just an aquatic. Just Polo's take on an aquatic. Um, but really, there's a lot going on in here. This is almost straddling that line right before, you know, once you get to 1995, 1996, that's where the hardcore aquatics... Um, you know, really start to take over. This is a little, still has a little foot in the past, you know, in, in the way that they um, were creating aquatics in the late 80s and let's say early 90s. And this still has a little foot in, in the past. And I think that's why I really like this. That's how it got ranked ahead of the creeds. Um, and it's just you know, it's just a brilliant creation, and and um, if you're someone who really likes the attention, believe it or not, if you can find these old bottles uh, with the silver atomizers that were created by Cosmere, I would I would do that. I would try to find the vintage. They're deeper, they're richer, they last longer. Um, man, these Cosmere bottles are really something. But uh, Polo Sport by Ralph Lauren from 1994 at number ten, number nine. So number nine, it may be a shock to some folks as well because of just where it's placed, um, because this is a cheapie. I don't know if it, you can still find it for what I found it for. I think I paid 19 bucks for this bottle, um, but this is sort of a um, precursor to Cherry Mugler's Amen, okay? So a couple years before this came out in 1992, Cherry Mugler released Angel <clears throat> for women, excuse me. This came out a couple years after Angel, and it took that heavy patchouli DNA and made it for men. And then a couple years later, Thierry Mugler did Amen, which I think has big, big, um, you know, strokes of, of this fragrance in it. So this is Animal, Animal for men. I love this stuff. And Parfumo, I don't know if it's true or not, but Parfumo says it's discontinued, that it was last marketed by Parlux, and it's discontinued. So... I don't know what is going on with this fragrance, but I can tell you that uh, if you like fragrances like the tier, like the Amen line, any of them, you know, if you like pure malt, if you like pure uh, Havan, if you like the original Thierry Mugler's uh, Amen, if you like Angel for Women, I would urge you to try this. It does have a little bit of that sweet gourmand thing going on. Um, there is a little bit of, of the... Um, you know, ethyl maltol sweetness or whatever you want to call it in there, right? But uh, it has notes that I really like as well. So it's got tobacco, it's got that honey, uh, it's got the patchouli, of course, the heaviness of the patchouli, and it just has this crazy makeup of notes, kind of like you you read Thierry Mugler's Amen, and you wouldn't think it would work, right? You read all these crazy notes, tar and cotton candy and all this insane stuff, but it does, it just works, right? This has pineapple, Patchouli, tobacco, honey, sandalwood, vanilla, amber, jasmine, lily of the valley, musk, nutmeg, rose, ylang ylang, cedar, galbanum, lavender, lemon, and lime. And um, it's just, I'll tell you what, it is so, for, for the colder weather, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant, for $19, I am over the moon with this fragrance. Very glad to have it. And um, so with Thierry Mugler's Amen, Maybe not completely discontinued, but for all intents and purposes, with the way L'Oreal is treating that brand, it feels like it's not going to be around much longer. Or if it is, in what form will it be around? That's I, I really cherish that bottle of Animal Animal. And if you can still get it for 20 bucks, I'm telling you, grab it while you can. Um, okay, next on the list we have 
So that was Animal Animal number nine. Number eight is sort of the last aquatic fragrance, the highest ranked aquatic fragrance from, from uh, this year, in my opinion, because this is an aquatic the way I like aquatics done. And basically the way that the way that this fragrance is executed is just a touch of aquatic ingredients, uh, maybe a little bit of calone in the top or whatever um, Jean Carlio was using at the time, and then all fine French perfumery underneath. This is Voyageur by Jean Patou. And I know I've told this story on my channel before, but the um, the um, story behind this is that the owners of Jean Patou at the time, I forget the name, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Is it Chenille or um, whoever owned Jean Patou at the time? They uh, really wanted Jean Carlio to make an aquatic because, of course, Aramis New West came out in. Uh, 87 and then I think 88 cool water came out and so they saw the trend going and John Carleo was a classical perfumer he liked stuff from the past he liked doing his style fine French perfumery just think about Patou Poron think about Ma Liberté think about those type of older um, uh, you know Jean Patou fragrances right and he wasn't hearing it they were trying to tell him hey we want you to do an aquatic and he was like nope not going to do it, sorry. And, it, and at some point, they basically decided to say, hey, we're no longer asking. We are telling you, do an aquatic. So to his credit, he did. He did one. But the way he did it is he put some aquatic materials on top where you get a little bit of that aquatic stuff for 10 or 15, 20 minutes tops. And then it all dries down to lavender, sage, and woods with oak moss. And the woods are... Um, Cedarwood and sandalwood. It's a very classical type fragrance. Um, I think there's real Mysore sandalwood in this. Um, the fact that I could buy a bottle of this for $40 still is outrageous. I mean, I got this, I don't know, 18 months ago or something. Maybe a year ago or so, if I had to guess. But um, yes, I mean, if you are a fan of fine French perfumery, if you're a fan of the old style Jean Patou fragrances, give this a try. You know, don't let the cringy marketing and packaging sort of put you off. This is an aquatic, unlike any aquatic you've smelled. Uh, probably one of my favorite aquatic fragrances, um, just because of the way that the woodiness and the just the classical nature ends up coming through. It is discontinued, but um, you can you can still find bottles floating around for a very very reasonable price sometimes because people just don't know they don't they don't know what they have or uh they don't know there's real Mysore sandalwood in there and that was just Jean Carlio's style and we'll talk more about his fragrances later because there's another Jean Patou that's higher up on this list okay so that was uh Jean Patou Voyageur at number eight number seven number seven is a surprise because number seven was actually gifted to me by the great Anuj from Enchante Perfumes. If you follow my channel, you probably know Enchante quite well. Probably half my vintage collection was thanks to thanks to Anuj. Um, and one of my hauls that I uh, that I procured from him, he sent this as a freebie. You know, every now and then if you buy a bunch of stuff from him, he'll throw in a freebie. And this was the freebie. And I was absolutely blown away by this. This is called If for Men by Sorella Fontana, which is a house that no one talks about. I don't think they're around any longer. You can see the sort of short, shorter ingredient list. The distributor is a distributor that I don't think is around any longer. Um, Promo Parf? Promo Parf, yeah, they're not around any any longer. Made in Italy, um, and basically this fragrance really took me by surprise because it's a fragrance that almost seemed like a precursor to one of my favorite Anique Minardo creations. And if you've ever smelled this little bad boy, Jaipur Om, if you've ever smelled this. This will get you sort of in the ballpark, okay? But this came out years after If for Men. So, so If for Men is sort of like a uh, Italian style Jaipur Om. Think about it that way. So it's also a little bit greener, okay? So whereas Jaipur Om focuses more on 
the resins and benzoin and, and um, you know, Anik Minardo is really good at using those sort of oriental style notes, right? This does that, but it also adds a little bit of galbanum and myrtle, okay? So, so two sort of um, greener notes with basil. So, so three greener notes. Uh, but just the way that the cinnamon and the myrrh and the vanilla and the tonka and the benzoin all come together, it really reminds me of a precursor to the great Jaipur Om, one of my favorite uh, Anique Minardo creations. And um, uh, there's also a brilliant note of myrrh in here. And the myrrh is so warming and enveloping and... Um, oh, it's just, it's just lovely. I absolutely love If For Men. And I... Um, and this fell in my lap. I didn't purchase it. Uh, Anuj threw it in for free. Um, that's the thing about these vintage fragrances is so many times, more, way more times, more often than not, if I just come across a vintage fragrance like this, even if I know nothing about it, I'm always surprised by the quality, the, um, even the cheaper drugstore fragrances from, from the eighties and nineties, seventies, eighties, nineties will blow you away. Um, if you are into sort of exploring and going back in time and smelling different fragrances, you will be shocked by even stuff that no one talks about like this very well may shock you. This is like an Italian style Jaipur Om, just fantastic. And it comes with this little book. Um, and so it comes like this, this is the packaging and, um, uh, it comes with a, a Rudyard Kipling poem. And I've read this one before, but the poem is If. You can look it up if you want to read the whole thing. But um, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you. On and on and on. Fantastic poem, too, by Rudyard Kipling. So, and uh, this house, you know, I don't really know much about them. But it says, from 1936 onwards... Um, through almost 60 years of fervent activity, the Fontana sisters have been molding and strengthening the magical reputation of the Made in Italy label. So, I don't, you know, I, I don't hear anything about them. I don't know if they're still around or, or what's going on with them. Um, but they created a gem and if it's too bad it's discontinued. But uh, if you see it for cheap, grab it. Grab it indeed. Okay. Uh, check out Anuj at Enchante. He very well may still have bottles. Okay. Next on the list. So that was number seven. Number six is going to be one of my favorite tobacco fragrances that very few people talk about. Well, that's not true. A lot of people still... I wouldn't say a lot, but uh, I, I think it's a fragrance that does get discussed still, but not as much as it should. I think it should get more limelight. I'm going to review this one day, God willing. Uh, this is Aramis Havana. So Havana has some similarities to this little bad boy right here. Yeah. This is um, uh, Claude Montana. Um, oh man, I am starting to lose my, uh, my grip today. Montana Parfum Dome, excuse me, Montana Parfum Dome. If you smell this, this actually has more of like a leather tilt, whereas this focuses more on the, um, tobacco side of things. And so they both have this spicy, woody character. They're both very distinctive fragrances as well, but, um, this, even though it has a little bit of leather in the base, you really get to focus more on the tobacco in the heart. And there's a lot going on in this fragrance. Nathalie Feistower, one of her best creations, and Xavier Renard created this. Um, oh, it's brilliant. It's almost like just a little bit of clove in here, too. Even though there isn't any clove listed, you get a little bit of that, you know, um, it's almost like a smoky, aldehydic clove note with tobacco and, and old school carnation, amber and leather. Um, but the tobacco is really prominent. That is Havana by Aramis. And rumor is that this potentially, this whole gentleman's collection could be discontinued. So if that's true, that is uh, very sad, very sad news indeed. Okay, so that is number six. So we're getting into the big boys now. Number five, number five is, um, 
a fragrance you used to be able to find at like TJ Maxx for like $10. And now, now it's selling for hundreds on eBay, which is ridiculous. I've seen it for three, four hundred dollars. Don't pay that. But it is a really good fragrance. And um, one of my favorite fragrances with the note of vodka in it. And this is Catalyst for men in the brilliant beaker bottle. Um, I was actually able to procure the aftershave as well, which is just beautiful. It's um, It's got this. Let me see if I can show you. Yeah, so it has this. Um, it has this two-tone feature about it. So the aftershave comes comes like this. And you can see how it's separated. And then whenever you mix it up, you can mix it up, use it, and then it separates again. Very cool. Um, I love the chemistry aspect of the packaging. You know, they spent more time on this drugstore fragrance packaging than, than um, Tom Ford spends on their private collection. Uh, you know, the all the packages are the same on the Tom Fords and even the Rojas with the bedazzled cap and all that stuff. They, they're stock bottles or they're stock, you know, it feels like um, each bottle is sort of the same, you know even though they put a different name and stuff, they're not doing a different bottle for every single creation, right? And and these guys did, you know, back then. Every every fragrance used to get its own packaging, which I miss. I miss those days for sure. But Catalyst has a note listing which will make Roja Dove blush. It is a huge note listing. Um, you can go check it out. I mean, there's a million notes in here, but it sort of comes across as this very spicy, woody, um, there's a uh, mint, so there's some freshness in the top with basil, tarragon, one of my secret ingredient notes that I absolutely love, vodka in the top, and then just a whole host of things. Black currant, cinnamon, nutmeg, oak moss, frankincense, labdanum, leather. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, really, really masculine, spicy, woody, doesn't have that sweetness. There's a little bit of castorium, and I, I think in the base here is my guess, just a touch animalic, but... Um, that spicy, woody, smoky, um, slightly green with that alcohol-like vibe and the, you know, whole beaker chemistry thing is just perfect for this scent. So, brilliant. Catalyst for Men, number five. Number four. Number four is another discontinued scent. Unfortunately, I think the from here on out we're in discontinued territory. But um, this is a fragrance that I think got re-released as Fuel for Men. And it's the only fragrance from the house of Donna Karen worth going for, in my opinion. This is DK Men. So DK Men um, from 1994. DK, come on baby, there you go. DK Men, you can see it says Cologne right there. Um, and DK Men is a spicy, leathery scent that basically focuses on a couple things. Tobacco, suede, spices, and there's some citrus notes in the top, but there's a brilliant osmanthus note. And the osmanthus note in here is extremely uh, prominent. The osmanthus note adds that sort of suede-like um, uh, apricot, peachy, little bit and there's a and and what ends up happening as it continues to dry is you get a you get a little bit more of that osmanthus like um you know suede peachiness that starts to come out and you get a little and you get this floral heart so you start to smell some flowers um obviously osmanthus is a flower as well which is one of the most prominent flowers to my nose but you'll get some other things like rose and heliotrope and stuff like that uh, but it dries down to this suede ambery incense. So it's almost like an amber. It dries down to almost like this ambery incense. And it's just a brilliant designer. I wish they made designers like this still. Uh, apparently it's supposed to be like, um, I've heard all kind of things about the bottle. Some, some, someone said that it's supposed to be like, um, hence the name fuel. I think it's supposed to be like a fuel pump, like 
you know, filling up your car, or I heard someone say it's like supposed to be a shift, a shifter of your car. I don't know. I've, I've seen some reviewers pretend it's a gun and shoot people with it, but, um, you know, I wouldn't go pay insane money for this, but uh, if you find a bottle at a respectable price, it is, um, it is, um, I think, just an amazing, and, and that sort of dry down gives it this very, almost like almondy, guerlain, ambery, vanillic dry, it's so good, so, so very good, uh, DK Men from 1994, okay, next on the list we have number three, so top three, Number three is probably my favorite fresh tobacco fragrance ever, and uh, perfect for summer. This is the great Dolce & Gabbana Pour Homme. Now, what you want is the one that says, made in Italy, Euro Italia. Someone showed me a Procter & Gamble bottle recently that was made in Italy, and I don't know. Or I don't know if those are good or not, but um, if you can find these Euro Italia made in Italy ones with the with the little crappy sticker that I had to tape on because it keeps falling off. Just brilliant. I mean, uh, Italian in style with this amazing citrusy sort of, uh, uh, you know, almost like fleshy bergamot in the top with orange and lavender, tarragon, the secret ingredient, cardamom, pepper, sage, and then it's that tobacco, cedar, sandalwood, tonka bean. But the secret weapon here is iris. So it's like a tobacco iris italian style citruses in the top that just seem to last forever uh just a beautiful fresh tobacco i'm sure there's some oak moss in here um just i mean for a fresh tobacco scent i don't think you can get better than this this is perfection uh i know carolina herrera for men from a year or two before this sort of set the stage i think for this to come but dolce and gabbana just perfected it with pour Homme from 1994. So yes, just a, a boss scent as far as I'm concerned. Okay, top two. And again, both are discontinued. Um, but uh, you could still see some bottles of number one floating around a little more easily than number two. Number two is going to be really tough for you to find. Um, I got lucky because a friend reached out and said, hey, I'm selling a bottle and they gave me a very fair price. But this is Patou Pour Homme Privé at number two. So probably one of the best sandalwood scents uh, of all time. And basically, one thing about Jean Carlio that I, I, I should mention since we talked a little bit about him and his creation of Voyager is most people see the prices on these. So, you know, a bottle of this full, I guess, would go for like a thousand bucks, right? Or whatever it is. I mean, I've seen even crazier prices, but let's just say it's a thousand dollars. So, whenever people see that price and they don't really know what's going on, a lot of times they just inherently think, oh, this is going to be like the most complex, insane fragrance of all time. It's not. It's actually a fairly simple construction. Um, well, maybe not simple in construction, but, you know, what I think um, people, vintage lovers gravitate towards Jean Carlio's style because he highlighted notes that don't get used today very often. So for example, he loved to use a lot of real oak moss and real Mysore sandalwood in large quantities. Um, and, you know, these scents, like for example, Patou Pour Homme, the OG from 1980, and even, even this one, the Privé, which the Privé, it's almost like more of a fougere style of Patou Pour Homme. It adds that uh, lavender, which is missing from the original, um, the original doesn't have the lavender in it, and this one adds this lavender, and it also adds this hay, and so it really starts to lean more towards a spicy floral fougere, um, but, uh, that, that brilliant sandalwood note in here is, is sort of the star of the show. I would say don't pay 500 or a thousand bucks for this. Go pay a hundred dollars or 120 or whatever you can get it for and get yourself a bottle of Ma Liberté. Came out a couple years before this, marketed towards women. Um, but I actually, I actually like Ma Liberté even more than this. But this has its place because this is sort of a stripped down, you know, version of, of it. And it really, what it allows it to do though is it allows the notes to shine. So it allows you to see that brilliant sandalwood note without all this other stuff floating around. Ma Liberté has a lot going on. It's a very complex fragrance, which I love. I love complex fragrances, but 
sometimes when it's very complex, you know, and there's a million things going on, you can't focus on the beauty of the sandalwood as easily. And this just really peels it all back. That's the brilliance of some of Jean Carlio's creations is they're not the most complex things in the world, but man, they smell so good. And, and you can really, that's something that um, Jean-Claude Elena believes in too. He believes that you really can't focus on a million notes at once. You're only going to get to focus on three, four, five notes. And that's something that his teacher, Edmund Rudnitska, taught him as well, that really focus on a handful of notes because that's all people are going to be able to, to pick up anyways. They're not going to be able to pick up a hundred different notes. And um, that's something that Jean Carlio did brilliantly with Patu Porom and the Privé. But the Privé brings in that lavender and hay and, and patchouli and it's just, you know, a little bit of vanilla in the base. It, it's a, whenever I'm wearing a suit and I have like an important meeting, this is the kind of thing that I'll wear. It's just separates you even if someone's wearing like the most expensive roja fragrance they won't smell like you you know they 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 could go down and buy this for five hundred dollars they can't go down and buy this for any amount of money at the store anymore right so it just like separates you from the pack in my opinion and that leaves number one and if you know 1994 you probably know what this is um this is a fragrance that i went through about half a bottle and it broke and I had to decant the rest to save it. So I still have about 50 mils from that original bottle, I think, floating around. Um, and then I bought another. I bought a 75 mil. And this fell in my lap for extremely cheap. This is the 125 mil big boy. So now I basically have over 200 mils of, of this. I never want to be without it. Number one is the great Luciano Pavarotti. One of the greatest celebrity fragrances of all time. I would probably venture to say the greatest celebrity fragrance of all time. Discontinued. Oh. So, here's the thing. So, this fragrance, even though it came out in 1994, it shares some commonality to me with more like stuff that came out in the 70s. Even the color of the juice. I mean, um, Givenchy Gentleman from 1974. And it also shares some similarities with Moss Brex. If you ever smell Moss Brex by Tom Ford, I'll review this before I'm all out of juice. Uh, but this is a unicorn right now. But if I could buy one Tom Ford, it would be Moss Brex. If, if, you, if I could pick one, that would be the one um, that I would add to the collection. I think that's probably one of my favorite Tom Fords. And it takes pages from Pavarotti and Givenchy Gentleman. Um, almost like a patchouli through the years, you know, but this has an ivy note in the top, which um, is a little bit of a rare note. Maybe I'll do a video on rare notes in perfumery um, and highlight some of the strange notes. Like uh, yesterday I talked about, I reviewed um, Fiore d'Ambra by uh, Perfumum Roma, and that had an opium poppy note in it. So maybe I'll do like a video on weird notes. I think that's a good idea. Uh, but there's an ivy note in here. There's neroli. Again, neroli from 1994. Bergamot, Sicilian lemon, vervain, petit gras, uh, geranium, cedar, clove, iris, patchouli, damask rose, oak moss, tonka bean, amber, honey, apopanax, Russian leather, vanilla, and liatris spicata. Now, I will tell you that Russian leather note, when you wear this in the heat, at least on my skin, that Russian leather note really comes out. It really pops. It 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 flies off of my skin. Once it warms up, I get more and more of that Russian leather, and I am just in love with this fragrance. It's one of my brother's, Rich Mitch's favorite fragrances. Um, I don't know if he's reviewed it. I think he has. Uh, go check out his channel um, for a Luciano Pavarotti you know, review. I think he has reviewed it. But, um, yeah, he, he went through an entire 125 mil bottle himself. So, um, so yes, that's my number one fragrance from 1994, in my opinion, which is crazy to some people because many of the most expensive creeds and stuff like that are sort of towards the back of the ranking. But for me, a celebrity fr fragrance that many people overlooked is, is my all-time favorite from 1994. Um, the patchouli leather honey lover in me just can't, I love honey and fragrances and, oh man, this is so, I, maybe I'll even wear this tomorrow. It's so good. So thanks everyone for watching. Let me know what your favorites are from 1994. 
Love seeing your faces in the comments. Appreciate the support, everyone. Cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.